begin now. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our 2023 World COPD Day event. My name is Elizabeth Almonte, and my peers and I will be presenting today's webinar. We are all students at San Jose State University's Department of Public Health and Recreation. I'd like to introduce you to my teammates now. First, we have Sabrina Ayubi, Tan Deng, Guang Kim, Tao Nguyen, myself, Elizabeth Almonte, Jamie Barton, Tu Van Lee Son, and Marisol Romero Robles. So we're here today to talk to you about COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a condition affecting millions of people worldwide, with more and more being diagnosed every single day. We're also here to talk to you about the impact of COPD in our communities and how to bring hope to those living with this condition. This project is a collaboration with Breathe California of Bay Area, Golden Gate, and Central Coast. It has been an absolute pleasure working with Breathe California staff and team members, and we're very happy that you are here attending our event today. Now, I'd like to go over our agenda. We will first begin with the words from Breathe California staff members. Then, Dr. Antonella Pinturieri will deliver today's keynote address. We'll continue with a fun, online bingo game, and some information from physical therapist Shilpa Dodd. After that, you will have a chance to win some door prizes. And finally, to close, yoga instructor Kalpana Thiagarajan will take us through some breathing exercises. Now, I'd like to introduce you all to Sharman Sultana. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, everyone. I am Sharmin Sultana. I am the health educator and senior health program manager at Breathe California. Our organization is one of the state's oldest voluntary health organizations. We were founded in San Jose in 1911. That means that we have been addressing critical lung health threats, promoting healthy lifestyles, and reducing the impact of lung disease through prevention, education, patient support, research, and advocacy for 112 years. From 1911 on, we spent several decades fighting the tuberculosis epidemic with great success. Over the years, our partnership-focused approach and our skill at adapting has allowed us to face new lung health challenges as they arise. Our work has expanded into the areas of asthma, tobacco prevention and cessation, lung cancer, environmental stewardship, clean air, and providing CPAP machines at low cost to sleep apnea patients. Our most recent activities have been related to COVID-19, RSV, and protecting lung health during the wildfire seasons. And uh, Breathe California also sees great value in collaborating with young community leaders to foster their professional development as health educators. So we are very happy to working with the talented San Jose students, uh, San Jose State students that will be presenting today's educational webinar. Thank you all for your efforts on this project. And we all, ready, we all are ready to learn more about COPD today. So now I would like to introduce our new CEO, Tania Paipali. Thank you, Sharman. And hello and good morning. Welcome everyone. And if you're in other parts of the world, greetings of the day. Uh, I'm Tanya Payapilli, CEO of Breathe California of the Bay Area, Golden Gate, and Central Coast. First, I'd like to thank the Learn More, Breathe Better program of the NHLBI, a key partner in our common efforts to educate people about COPD. As a federal agency, they must follow guidelines about how they are represented so you won't see their logo on our educational promotional materials. We still want to acknowledge their support, not only for this event, but for that which they give to groups and individuals across the country. You can join their Breathe Better program. They help translate research into usable information for the public and for healthcare professionals and provide a wide array of educational materials, all of which you can find on their website. Next, I'd like to thank um, El Camino Health and the city of San Jose for partnering with us to support this event. Um, the first World COPD Day was held in 2002. And each year, 
activities are held in more than 50 countries to raise awareness about this disease, COPD, and this includes educational activities such as what we are doing today at Breathe. We are proud to be the organizer of World COPD Day 2023, and we thank all of you present here, health professionals, health educators, and members of the pet public who want to make an impact locally and worldwide. Breathing is life, act earlier. And this aims to help highlight the importance of early diagnosis and interventions because breathing definitely should not be a struggle. Finally, I'd like to thank our dear, dear students and partners from the public health program at San Jose State University who have been working really hard for the last few months to plan and present this webinar. They're responsible for today's event and the success of today's event. And on that note, I'll hand off to you, Guang. Thank you, Tanya. I would like to thank everyone's attending today's event. We hope that you'll learn a lot and have some fun doing it. I'd like to welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. Antonello Pinturieri. We're very fortunate to have him here with us today. Dr. Antonello Pinturieri, PhD and MD, is a program officer in the Division of Lung Diseases for the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health. In this capacity, Dr. Pontrieri administers a varied portfolio of grants and contracts in the area of COPD and environment. Specifically, he participates in the development and administration of programs that aim at the understanding of COPD disease mechanisms, COPD prevention, and the testing and evaluation of COPD therapies. Dr. Pontrieri obtained the MD from the Medical School and University of Ferrara Italy, and a PhD in Immunology from La Sapienza University in Rome. After years of further professional experience and leadership in Europe and the U.S., he joined the NHLBI in 2006. Please give Dr. Pinturieri your attention during his presentation. If you have questions for him, please click the Q&A button on your screen. After he's finished, we'll continue with the Q&A and request session later on. And now on today's keynote speech, take it away, Dr. Pinturieri. Thank you, Juan, and thank you for the organizer for inviting me, and <clears throat> I thank the audience in advance for participating in, in this seminar. Let me share my slides. I see they're projected. So we are here to learn more about CPD, but also to celebrate, to, as it was uh, anticipated. We are celebrating tomorrow, actually, World COPD Day. November 15, and we are celebrating November, which is the CUPD Awareness Month. We all want to learn more about CUPD to try to understand better the disease and to bring relief to those that suffer from it. So a few quick facts about CUPD. CUPD, it's, uh, it's the short acronym that we use for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. So it's a lung disease. It is unfortunately the sixth leading cause of death in the US and accounts for more than 140,000 deaths per year. To give you an idea of what that represents, there are about 145, 150,000 deaths for lung cancer every year. So very close to that. An estimated 6% of US adults have been diagnosed with COPD. And this turns out to be about 16 million people. But the data are showing us that most likely millions more have the disease, but they're not aware of it. CPD is not only a chronic disease, it's, it's a killer, but it's also a leading cause of disability. People with CPD struggle with their life in all the, its aspects. So what is COPD? COPD, as mentioned, is a serious lung disease and that over time, it makes it harder and harder to breathe. You can see here on, on this panel, a brief explanation, less air goes in and out of the airways. And the reasons for these are some of, of these illustrated here. The airways and the air sacs lose elasticity. The walls between the air sacs are destroyed. So from these little circles, we have a big circle, but the, the way the lung works, it, it, it makes uh, the surface of exchange for gas exchange using these little sacs 
incredibly big. And I don't know if you know this, but if you would put your lungs and all the alveoli open up, it will cover a tennis court. So with this system, nature has found a way to put in, in, a, in a small space in your chest an enormous surface for exchange of gases. And you understand that when you destroy those, that goes down. Other reasons for airflow not flowing in the, in the, in the right amount is that the airways become inflamed, thick. And the other minor thing is that the airways not only become inflamed, but inflammation also promotes mucus. And mucus clogs the airways. So all these four factors combine for making your lungs less efficient. And indeed, if it's left untreated, people with COPD gradually lose their stamina and their ability to perform daily activities. COPD is mainly an umbrella term and it covers two conditions. The airway disease, so chronic bronchitis, again, mucus pr production inflammation, and emphysema, which is the tissue destruction. The alveolar membranes, as I explained in, in the other slides, break down. Each patient with COPD has both of these components, but in different amounts. Some have a more prevalent chronic bronchitis form, some have a more emphysematous form, but again, both are combined in the same patient. What are the signs and symptoms of COPD? Mostly these five. So first and foremost, there is a constant coughing. Sometimes it's called smoker's cough. Shortness of breath. And, and this is experienced every day in doing the most menial activities by the patients. Inability to breathe easily or take a deep breath. Excess mucus production and it can be coughed up as sputum, and wheezing. Wheezing is basically a sound that comes out from your pipe, and that's because they're narrowed while you breathe. So causes and risk factors. Direct, and I'm gonna make a distinction between direct and indirect or second and smoking. Direct cigarette smoking is responsible for about 80% of COPD death. And smoking is the number one cause of COPD, with 75, 80% cases occur in people who have a history of direct smoking. And you can get COPD, unfortunately, even if you stop smoking. So the message here, the take home message, quit smoking as soon as you can. 35% of people diagnosed with COPD are still smoking, but about 40% are former smokers. Now, roughly one in four, 20, 25% of people who have COPD have never smoked cigarettes directly. There are other causes of COPD, and among them, long-term exposures to lung irritants, second and smoke, it's a big culprit. And other lung irritants, such as, for example, chemicals, dust, fumes from the environment or workplace agricultural dust and fumes, for example. Hence, the reason to have protections while you are in an environment that produces dust and fumes. And then for a minority of people with COPD, there is a genetic condition, which is called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or AAT deficiency for brief. And these people usually get COPD even if they've never smoked or had exposure to these irritants. And usually they get COPD earlier than smokers. So in the late 30s, early 40s. Who is at higher risk for COPD? Some are more at risk than others, men versus women. And COPD was thought to be until probably 15 years ago an exclusive male disease. And unfortunately, women caught up. Right now, 6% of women and 5% of men have a diagnosis of COPD. And the other fact is, since the year 2000, more women die of COPD per year than men. The geographic distribution, the prevalence of COPD is higher in rural areas. And I mentioned exposure to irritants and dust, but also in rural 
areas smoking is higher uh, the prevalence of smoking is, is much higher than what you would observe in urban areas as a matter of fact you can see nine percent of cpd in rural versus a three four percent in urban there is a higher prevalence in southeastern areas of the mississippi and ohio river valleys and again, this is partially related to, to smoking percentage. There are some racial ethnic groups that are more affected by CBD, more diagnosed. American Indians and Alaska Natives, you can see, unfortunately, take the lead here with 8% whites, 6% non-Hispanic Blacks, and then gradually diminishing for Hispanics and Asians. How do you diagnose CPD? CPD is a diagnosis that is based on signs and symptoms, personal and medical history, physical examination, and lung function tests, such as spirometry. Spirometry, there is another slide that shows it, is when your doctor, your healthcare provider is gonna ask you to blow in a tube, and then there are instruments here that measure how fast and how much you put out from your lungs. There are also chest X-ray that can uh, show specific patterns for COPD. A better diagnosis though is done with a chest CT scan, a computer tomography scan. And in some instances, the healthcare provider may wanna measure how much oxygen is in your blood. And so there is a, an arterial blood gas test that they can go with that. So, Diagnosing COPD. It is estimated that millions do not realize that have COPD and are under and undiagnosed. One of the reasons is that patients do not always report their symptoms or smoking history to their providers and, by the, and vice versa, providers don't ask thoroughly to patients about their smoking history. The top diagnostic barrier are, one is that the patient does not fully report the symptoms again you know coughing sputum production difficulty breathing there are more immediate health issues patients with copd are not only disease in their lung but it's a whole body disease and there are patients with copd for example 30 to 35 percent of them have also cardiovascular disease they may have high blood pressure and so when, when they go to the doctor, when a patient, a, a, a person with COPD goes to the doctor may have these other issues coming up. Diabetes is also pretty frequent in, in COPD patients. 31% of patients do not report uh, in full that there is smoking history. And uh, again, this could be also secondhand smoke. And some people don't realize it. I, I talk with many uh, patients uh, that never realized that the second hand smoke could be so damaging. And so they didn't think it was important. Here is spirometry. You see that this person is blowing in this instrument and uh, here there are detectors that are gonna measure the output from your lungs. It's non-invasive as you can see. Uh, it's a quick and simple breathing test. There are even more simple instruments than the one depicted in this picture. There are, you know, they don't need big apparatuses. They're portable. They, they can stay on, 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 a, on a little table. The test will show how healthy your lungs are and if you have COPD and how serious it is. And the spirometry can help your provider to know if you have COPD before you even have symptoms. Which brings me to one important point. Uh, I mentioned it, uh, talking about cigarette smoking, uh, the sooner you quit, the better it is. It's that the disease is very insidious. It doesn't come, you know, all or nothing. It, it's progressive. And so before you experience symptoms, there may be other signs, for example, um, you know, that are found through spirometry or to a CT scan that can tell, your provider that there's something going on in the lungs. How do you live better with COPD? You wanna get ahead of symptoms and talk with your healthcare provider about them. 
the provider can put you on a path to better quality of life. And among the many actions that can be taken by the person with CPD is if you're still smoking, of course, quit smoking, avoid pollutants of, of uh, as I said, you know, dusts, fumes, including uh, wildfires, smoke from wildfires in this case. Visit your provider regularly and take your prescribed medications. Stay current with vaccinations. And I have more slides about vaccination and why they are very important for people with COPD. And of course, get support from family and friends. It's a disease uh, hard to cope with and it definitely needs uh, the, the help uh, of, of family and friends to, to be tackled. Here is a slide about CPD and vaccines. Patients with CPD are, are at higher risk for serious complications uh, from certain illnesses preventable with vaccinations. And here are the four that right now should be in the mind of, of people with CPD and that should be brought up uh, with, with the healthcare provider. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, the flu, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV for short, where we have a new vaccine and it's recommended for people at age 60 and over. And then pneumococcal disease for people at age 65 and over. Again, all these, if you haven't done it on your own already, a good topic of conversation with your healthcare provider. Indeed, it's not that People with COPD catch COVID more than people that do not have COPD. But unfortunately, because of the disease, there are higher rates of hospitalizations once you get it. And unfortunately also, this leads to a higher mortality. One of the reasons for this, and one of the reasons why I'm saying get your vaccination is that SARS-CoV-2 patients have antibody titers and specific T cells, the cells that combat the virus in addition to the antibodies. They're reduced in number relative to healthy control and their number also declines in, with, with time faster than in people that do not have COPD. So if you get a vaccination, a booster, that is gonna help you keep up good tight, good, good amounts of antibodies and of these T cells in your blood. Advancing knowledge. How do you overcome barriers to prevention, early diagnosis, treatment, and management of COPD? Can help slow the progression of the disease and lessen some of the symptoms. We know that of those that have COPD or know someone who does, 50% are interested in getting more information about COPD and its treatment. Of particular interest is of course, information about availability, effectiveness of treatments, effectiveness of new treatments and ongoing research. In the armamentarium that we have, the tools that we have right now are of course medications. You see a pill here, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, healthy living and lifestyle changes. All these combined contribute to make a person with COPD feel better and cope better with the disease. In this slide, there are listed some of the treatments for COPD, medications as mentioned, pulmonary rehabilitation or PR for short, lifestyle changes, including quitting smoking if you're still a smoker, avoid exposure to irritants, oxygen therapy if your healthcare provider determines that oxygen would be beneficial for you. Oxygen is not beneficial for everybody. NHLBI did a trial on oxygen actually in people which didn't fall within what Medicare uh, prescribes, uh, uh, the numbers, uh, and I'm not gonna go in detail in that, and found that it didn't make any difference in the life of these patients. But at the same time, we know that oxygen therapy is important for certain patients with COPD. And we also know how cumbersome is 
uh, getting oxygen therapy for various reasons that are beyond the research uh, that they relate uh, to, to coverage. But NHLBI is investing in new research, for example, in finding um, different ways of, of uh, creating tools that, that deliver oxygen, uh, portable tools um, that would make it easier for people with COPD to receive oxygen when needed. Then uh, these other two uh, therapies are um, in, in the surgical path. Um, sometimes you need to have a part of your lung removed uh, because uh, the, the tissue is so destroyed that, that it affects uh, uh, the rest of the lung. And so taking that out makes uh, the rest of the lung work better. Or in a recent development, what is called an endobronchial valve. An endobronchial valve basically helps uh, the air in, in a diseased part of the lung to get out. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why it's called hyperinflation. Some patients have difficulty um, in, in uh, breathing. In other words, they are not able to displace the air they already have there with fresh air. The endobronchial valve allows for that. And it's a much less, of course, it's an, a, a, a surgery, but it's a much less invasive surgery than uh, taking out a part of the lung. And people uh, are, are not cut open for that. It's done through a, an endoscope. Pulmonary rehabilitation. Pulmonary rehabilitation may help people uh, with breathing problems to live and breathe better. Two in three people who participate in pulmonary rehabilitation report positive outcomes reduces the symptoms, increases physical activity, improve daily life function, improve emotional health. Pulmonary rehabilitation is not only exercise, but it's a, a series of intervention. They range from uh, uh, coaching on healthy living, uh, diets uh, that are prescribed, and, and, and so on. I'm opening a little parenthesis on this. I remember while I was visiting in, in, in a rural part of the States, uh, um, a rehabilitation center. And there was this woman, probably she was in her 70s, late 70s. And uh, she was uh, a candidate for lung transplantation because there wasn't any other option available. Um, to undergo lung tra transplantation, the patient needed to all patients and need to uh, uh, follow a pulmonary rehabilitation cycle. Turns out that after the pulmonary rehabilitation, she improved so much that she didn't need lung transplantation anymore. So this, this anecdotal uh, story, you know, speaks to the value of pulmonary rehabilitation in every setting. How does PR help someone with chronic breathing condition? Again, doctor, nurses, physical therapist and respiratory therapist together design a program that is tailored to the needs of each person. It, it, it's not a, a, a cut and paste kind of a program. It's tailored again to each person with COPD. The results vary. And among the benefits of the program, there is an increased understanding and management of the disease. There is improved strength, enabling a more active lifestyle, reduced symptoms of depression and anxiety, and opportunities for peer support. Uh, pulmonary rehabilitation usually is conducted uh, in groups, in small groups, but uh, with, with other people that have COPD. As I said, the program <coughs> covers multiple parts. It's not only exercise training to build stamina and flexibility, but breathing techniques such as Firstly, breathing from yoga to help alleviate the sense of being out of breath. Instruction in finding easier energy saving ways to do everyday's task, help to stop smoking. Psychological counseling, if you're smoking, psychological counseling for emotional problems. And as I was mentioning, nutritional counseling for optimal health. Somebody could ask, uh, especially coming out of, of the COVID pandemic, where we, we had a lot of uh, telehealth uh, uh, used in, in various settings, in various disease settings, will the future of PR include video telehealth? Indeed, it does. It's not only the future, but it's also the current. 
state uh, of, of things. It's clearly the pulmonary rehabilitation is, uh, is poor, uh, unfortunately, is poor access to PR facility and capacity constraints in those facilities. So video telehealth might improve access, especially for patients who live in low population areas, again, rural population for whom transportation is difficult. NHLBI actually funded preliminary trials on video telehealth during the pandemic, uh, founded before the pandemic and, and, the, and the, the trials needed to be pivoted to our telehealth in the pandemic and the results were actually satisfactory. As a matter of fact, right now there is a larger and more rigorous trial that is currently being supported by an HLBI, which started exactly you know, with, with that question, can uh, telepulmonary rehabilitation uh, be vicarious to in-person pulmonary rehabilitation in a clinic? NHLBI also has studies, ongoing studies on, on the epidemiology of COPD in rural setting. One of the cohorts, a rural cohort, is called RURAL. It, it stands for Risk Underlying Rural Areas Longitudinal Cohort Study. And it's looking at 10 counties in four states, evaluating the health of more than 4,000 participants over a period of six years. This is an ongoing study. And we have a study that is almost finished and it's in, in progress of, of, of publication and it's called Capture. And it's assessing whether a brief questionnaire and breathing test can help identify more people with COPD. As I mentioned at the beginning, we know about the 15, 16 million that have been diagnosed, but we, we also have data that are pointing to the fact that probably another three to six million people have COPD and don't know they have it. Now, I also mentioned that the disease comes progressively. So you don't have the symptoms, but you may have the disease in your lung. Indeed, one of the, of the studies funded by NHLBI is called SPIROMICS. It's another acronym. I'm not going to expand it. Found that 50% of people with a history of smoking, so half of them, they have a good spirometric test have significant respiratory symptoms. Many of these individuals went to their healthcare provider and, and the doctor prescribed to them COPD drugs, even though they did not have lung obstruction as measured by spirometry. There was lung damage measured by a CT scan as observed through a CT scan. And so the question was, do these drugs prescribed to these specific patients do anything for them. And uh, the, we, we conducted a trial again for short, it's called Rethink, and this is what it, what it stands for. The participants were given a combination of bronchodilators, short is LABA and LAMA. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, if not all of you are familiar with those. But the result was that the symptoms did not improve. So what does that mean? And that means that we need uh, to address early COPD. Again, these patients didn't have symptoms. They have a relatively normal lung, but with you know, in beginning signs of COPD. We need to look for other uh, ways of, of addressing the therapy of this stage of the disease. Awareness of COPD. So awareness has increased in the past 10 years. And uh, I'm sure all of you see the commercials on TV. Uh, for COPD drugs. However, still one quarter of adults in the US have not heard of COPD. And three out of 10 people with COPD go undiagnosed and untreated. In 2018, seven out of 10 people who were symptomatic of COPD reported those to their healthcare providers. We're missing a, a three out of 10, three per, 30%. To, to address the problem of COPD, um, NHLBI was tasked by Congress to develop a, a plan with the help of other government agencies. And this is the first ever blueprint for a multifaceted unified fight against the disease. It provides a comprehensive framework for 
for action by those affected by the, the disease and those who care about reducing its burden. The, the brochure can be obtained for free at copd.nih.gov. What does the plan consist of? There are five goals, five major goals, and they cover all the aspects of COPD, starting, of course, with people with COPD to empower them, their families and caregivers to recognize and reduce the burden of COPD. Then there is a, a research goal that, that goes to improve prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management of the disease by improving the quality of care delivery across the healthcare continuum. That means from basic research that is going to tell us why there is COPD, how that becomes COPD, all the way to, of course, treatments and, and so on. And there is a third goal that is the one that everybody that works in CPD needs or in any other disease, that is the data. You need the numbers. You need to know where the disease is, who has it, because it could give us ideas on, uh, again, who's susceptible, what is the susceptibility in those people, um, what are they exposed to, and so on. And so that is collect, analyze, report, and disseminate COPD-related data. Increase and sustain research to better understand prevention, pathogenesis, diagnosis, treatment, and management of COPD. You see that AIM-2 and AIM-4 are strictly correlated. And then, of course, once you have uh, data, once you have uh, uh, therapies that have been proven effective, you need to do the implementation of all this. And so translating national policy, educational, and program recommendation into not only research, but also public health care actions. So these are the five goals of the COPD National Action Plan, or COPD NAP for short. NHLBI, again, with, with the help of other agencies and of other contributors, has established also uh, since three years ago now, the CPD National Action Plan Community Action Tool, which can be viewed at this website, cnap.nhlbi.nih.gov. The Action Tool is a central repository for the CPD community to capture activities, see and report on progress toward implementing the goals of the CPD National Action Plan and collaborate with each other. And this is probably the, the most important part. So it's a place where people put okay, you know, our association has done this, and these are our results. And then, and this happens, let's say, in California. Then somebody else, let's say Maine, says, oh, that's very interesting, and it worked. I want to do the same. So there's, there's going to be a way for those two parts to get together, get in contact, and, and assess, of course, each one with its uh, differences to see what what can be implemented, how it can be implemented, the same thing or very close to it. So the community action tool, it's a, a, a basically a center that helps people to get in contact and see what activities could benefit their own community. And I encourage everybody to go and take a look at it to see if they can find inspirations for some activities related uh, to, to their communities. And indeed, as you can see here, uh, there are a lot of programs in the community action tools coming from the American Lung Association, from the American Thoracic Society, Breed California, thank you, Breed California for hosting us today, CDC, the Center for Disease Control, the COPD Foundation, COPD SOS, the Emphysema Foundation, the Hawaii COPD Coalition, the Kentucky Cabinet for Health and Family Services, the US COPD Coalition, the Rural Health Information Hub, the Respiratory Health Association, and the NHLVI NIH program, Learn More, Breed Better. The Learn More, Breed Better program provides free resources. Again, everything is downloadable, but you can also request the printout and they'll be delivered to you for free. Diagnosis, treatment, and management for patients and caregivers. 
There are videos, fact sheets, infographics, and social media resources, in not only for patients, but also for healthcare providers. And there is a provider toolkit, teaching tools, and patient handouts. As mentioned, we have also a COPD caregiver toolkit, which contains modules and videos about COPD, its management, questions for the doctor or the health care provider, self-care and more, infographic and social media graphics, and checklists and forms. Additional resources are at the websites that I mentioned that are presented in this slide. Feel free to access them. Uh, again, um, there, there is a lot to learn there, and I, I'm sure our participants will, in, in this conference will, will find a lot of useful information. And I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pantayeri, for your presentation. I think we all learned a lot. We appreciate your knowledge and experience and honor that you shared with our audience. And we do have some questions for you. Okay. So one question is, you mentioned getting vaccinated. Why are vaccines important for people with COPD? So COPD makes it hard to breathe because the airways can swell and be blocked and can be blocked by mucus as, as mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, some infections uh, that are preventable with vaccines cause further hindrance on the airways, for example, and cause swelling. So the combination then makes it even more difficult to breathe. So if you have both COPD and one of these vaccine preventable disease together, this can lead to more serious disease like a pneumonia or other serious respiratory illnesses. And this is true for patients with, with people with COPD, even if the condition is mild and the symptoms are usually, so before the infection, well controlled. So vaccinations are one of the safest way to protect your health, not, not only your health, but, but the health of those around you. And they provide the best protection against preventable disease, as mentioned, like flu, pneumococcal disease, COVID, and uh, also RSV. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we are not all the same. Uh, side effects range from mild and uh, to maybe uh, feeling a, a little bit more under the weather. But it's the end results that is important. It is, again, uh, giving your immune system the robustness that, that it needs to fight and prevent infections. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Another question is, can you share some of the latest ideas and treatments and when they might be available? So I mentioned uh, uh, several examples along, along my, my talk. And uh, indeed, uh, I think, we think, uh, the issue that the future, including the present, is bright for people with COPD. Uh, as mentioned, recent recent research may be transformative for understanding the disease and suggesting novel treatment strategies. We, we are accumulating an enormous amount of data coming from DNA studies, from imaging studies, um, even from animal model, models that are giving us new ideas. One fundamental concept is uh, we want to try, we are now trying to move the needle also to try to catch the disease early and see if we can do something at that stage. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in a, what you could think about it in a similar way as, uh, uh, for example, preventing breast cancer. So uh, doing early mammograms for that. And so, and research, as mentioned also, is looking at long-term effects of pulmonary rehabilitation in COPD. We know that it makes patients' life better uh, in, in the few months after rehabilitation. We would love to know if uh, rehabilitation can be administered more frequently and, and lead to, to better life for people with COPD. Um, speaking of that, if I don't have a pulmonary 
rehabilitation center near me. Is there a way I can do these exercises at home? There are definitely resources available for uh, pul pulmonary rehabilitation or PR. Uh, so you can talk to your healthcare provider about them to get started. PR is like going to the gym for your lungs. It's a combination, as I mentioned, of breathing exercise, tips to conserve your energy, improving strength and stamina, nutrition, counseling, psychological support, and more. It's best when it started in moderate stage of COPD. And even beyond pulmonary rehabilitation, maintaining physical activity as best as each person can, it's probably one of the best things that, that, that a person with COPD can do for himself or herself. If a loved one had COPD, what would you, uh, your number one piece of advice be for them? Unfortunately, there is no cure for COPD, but it doesn't mean that we need to give up once we have a diagnosis. There are steps that can help managing the symptoms and slow the progression of the disease. So it's important that people with COPD talk to their healthcare provider about medications, ongoing medical care, and stay updated on because new things come up, I'm not saying every day, but quite frequently. And obviously, uh, lifestyle changes and treatments can help people feel better, stay more active. Again, exercising is, is good and in any form and slow the progression of the disease. Another question is, my husband has COPD. And I'm looking for information to help me as a his caregiver. Yeah, this, this is an important aspect I mentioned during the presentation. Caregivers uh, and, and support for people with COPD in, in general from either family members or, or friends, it's a fundamental part of, of uh, dealing with the disease. NHLBI and the Respiratory Health Association have a COPD Caregivers Toolkit, as mentioned, that you can uh, look at at those websites. It has information about caring for someone with COPD, challenges at home, getting ready for, for a healthcare uh, provider visit, and how to take care of yourself. There are even videos that can be watched and uh, helpful forms that can be filled out to keep track of, of your loved one's care. In addition, the COPD Caregivers Toolkit can be found at NHLBI, as I mentioned, .nih.gov slash COPD caregivers. Caregivers can also get information about a wide range of caregiving issues at the National Institute of Aging or nia.nih.gov. So multiple resources. Okay, um, this question is about you now. Why did you pick this career path? Uh, that's an interesting question. Thank you. I, I found that this field would allow me to combine uh, the two things that inspire me to study. On one side, medicine, when I was much younger than I am now, and immunology and basic biology. And the two things are help people while discovering the causes of diseases. Very interesting, and you're so young. <laughs> Another question is, how did you begin with a research question? How do inspirations come up for you and your team? Oh, it's it's a process. It's not complicated. Excuse me, but it relies uh, from on multiple sources. They could be, you know, patients, for example, bring up issues, um, other peers. Uh, their caregivers, and of course, scientists that are studying the disease or doctors that are curing the disease. So it, it's a lot of parties that need to come together and give inspirations for uh, uh, you know, new ideas to be tested, new hypotheses to be investigated. Um, as, as an example, uh, uh, this morning I was reading a paper that was reporting survival of, of COPD and it's, you know, fresh off the presses, survival of, of COPD patient. And I wrote an email to the investigator that, that was the lead investigator on the paper with questions. And, 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 it, and he said, that's an interesting question. Uh, let me ask uh, so-and-so. So that's how you, that's how you come up with, you know, research question, hypothesis to be tested. It's a, uh, Information as usual, it's 
the, the most important uh, part of the thing to start a good conversation. Another question is, it seems like COPD is due to long-term smoking. What would you say to young people who smoke? Oh, the message I think was pretty clear during during my, my talk. Again, we know that 80% is due to direct cigarette smoking, um, both current or past, you know, partition between current smoker or, or past smoker. The message I think is pretty key, clear. People who smoke are damaging lungs, their own lungs, first of all, and possibly those of somebody else, but also th their heart. Because as I said, 30 to 35% of people with COPD also have a heart disease and uh, they are going to get damaged. And so uh, it, the sooner you quit, and we know that quitting is not easy, all the data are showing that, um, you know, but there are ways of helping a person that's still smoking uh, to, to quit. And, and I think it's a good conversation to have with an healthcare provider because there again there are medications uh, there are there is counseling uh, all combined together uh, give a good success rate in in quitting smoking what is some advice for your future respiratory therapist that you can give oh I, absolutely i i think uh, respiratory therapists are, are and i mentioned earlier are, are a fundamental part of the care of people with lung diseases in general, first of all, and of course, for people with COPD. Uh, it requires, of course, a lot of passion, uh, a lot of dedication, and it's not an easy job. Uh, I, I know quite a few respiratory therapists. But at the same time, it's a job that really gives satisfaction because you can really make a big change in the life of, of, of a person with COPD. I mentioned the example of that, of that elderly woman that you know was destined to a lung transplant and then after pulmonary rehabilitation she didn't need it anymore another question is if somebody's having chronic cough cough what would you advise them to do well chronic cough means uh, uh, a cough that that stays there so we have acute cough for example you can get the flu and then you have you have a cough but usually that one goes away in a couple of weeks but if the cough persists for uh, let's say a couple of months three months then i would report it to your healthcare provider uh, a cough could be a symptom of many many different things not necessarily copd but again you know it's an important thing that your body is telling you and that deserves attention, obviously. And so the sooner you bring it up to somebody that, that can help you establishing why you have a cough, the better it is. Okay. I think that concludes our questionnaire. Thank you so much for answering. Thank you, and... Marcel. Now then, let's have some fun. My teammates, Lau and Tao, will explain what's next on the agenda. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Marisol. Now, everyone, it's time for our bingo game. Everyone who plays uh, will have a chance to win a prize. And we have three special, special gifts for the first three winners. Please take a moment to read the rules from the slides before we begin. Okay, as you see, here's what you need to do. Click the chat button below, a chat window will open. Click on the bingo link in the chat window to start the game. The bingo game will appear in a separate browser window. Click the generate box to create a bingo card. As we can each one out, match the answer on your own card by clicking on the matching square the item will be related to CLPD, Lone House, or Bridge, California. When you get five eggs in a row, 
either going across or going down or going diagonally from corner to corner, click the raise your hand button. You will be invited to unmute yourself, come bingo, and verify your win. So now let's play bingo. For our first round of bingo, you'll be playing for a $10 CBS gift card. So let's begin. Okay, the first item I have is inhaler. And the next one, exercise. The next item is shortness of breath. The next item is chronic. The next item I have is asthma. The next item is breathe California. Breathe California. The next item is bronchitis. The next item is genetic factors. The next item is air quality. The next item is secondhand smoke. The next item is prevention. Oh, we have a bingo. Alexis actually jumped in on chat. Okay. So can you please confirm with me what your five items are? You oh. can put on the chat if you want or unmute yourself. Oh, there it is. Yep, Alexis put it into chat. So yeah, that's on our correct. So Alexis won that round. All right, congratulations. So now um, the first game is over. We will get ready for the second game. So everyone below your bingo card, right here. So click the stack of three little vertical lines you see. Several words will pop up Play, um, right here. Please click new. It will give you a new card to play for the second round. There you go. Okay, everyone get it? So this time the price will be a $15 CVS gift card. Let's start the new round. And for those of you who didn't win that round, if you can go ahead and put your hand down, you should just be able to hit the raise hand or put it on your screen. Um, and I, need, I see now, um, as soon as the next person wins, I will go ahead and um, allow you to talk so you can give the answers verbally. Let's start for the second round. So the first one is going to be asthma. The next one is going to be energy con conservation. The next one is going to be sadness of breath. The next item gonna be yoga. The next item, environment. The next word is gonna be chronic. Next item, inhaler. Next item, the breathe California. Breathe California. Next word is gonna be genetic factors. Next one is gonna be lung cancer. Next one is the exercise. Oh, looks like we have a winner. Um, this is Sharon and I will allow her to talk so she can give you her answers. And go ahead, Sharon. Hi, um, my words is Breed California exercise, shortness of breath, as conservation. Okay, so please confirm for me, Tao. Yeah, it's exactly. All right, okay. congratulations, Saren. So Great. for both of the CVS gift card winners, please email Salmon as long as don't or chief with your email address. So we send you a link to download the gift card. 
Okay, and for those of you who did not win, if you can put your hands back down again, and then Lee and Tao will take you into round three. So now on to our third game. The winner of this round will receive a 25 Sprout gift card and should email shaman at lungsrs.org with your email address so we can send it to you. Everyone, please uh, click start a new card again by licking the three lines and select new. Here we go. Okay, the first item I have is genetic factors. Okay, the next item is chronic. The next item is caregivers. The next item is exercise. The next item is bronchitis. The next item is lung cancer. The next item is environment. The next item I have is secondhand smoke. The next item is yoga. The next item is cough. And we have a potential winner, that would be Elizabeth. Um, I will allow you to talk to let them know that we have the right answers. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, hi, okay, so mine is caregivers, secondhand smoke, free bronchitis and exercise. That's not correct, congratulations. And also this was the last game. So thanks for uh, playing everyone. We not should email for stamming as long as ours with your mailing account so we can send or email your device to you. We will send your gift card later this week. And now here's the brain now. Hey everyone. Thank you, Lee and Tao, so much. Um, our next speaker is Shilpa Dot. Shilpa is a physical therapist at Kenfield Hospital. She has over two decades of professional healthcare experience as a physical therapist and certified case manager, working in acute hospital settings, skilled nursing facilities, home health, and hospice. Shilpa has worked with COPD patients as well as those with other respiratory conditions, including those on ventilator support or with tracheostomies. As a therapist, she has provided patients and caregivers with training and education on energy conservation techniques, the use of assist assistive devices, and safety. She is enthusiastic about a wide range of modalities to promote healing and overall wellness, believing in a deep connection between mind, body, and soul. Take it away, Shilpa. Thank you, Sabrina, for that great introduction. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining Breathe California, and happy World COPD Day. So I will um, share my screen now. Okay, let's see. So we are um, just going to browse through this and, and then if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask me or stop me, raise hand. So what is energy conservation? Energy conservation is a means of adapting the way you carry out your day-to-day -day activities. The aim is here to improve your quality of life by conserving your energy for the activities that you like to do, as well as the one that you have to do with a safe and well-structured environment. The importance of energy, energy conservation technique you have to use that efficiently and productively. And this could improve overall quality of life. We go by what we call seven Ps to, when we teach our patients and caregiver um, techniques about energy conservation. First one is prioritizing. Decide what needs to be done. Keep your schedule simple. Spread it, your household chores throughout the week. Second is planning. Start your day with the most strenuous activity and avoid overwork. Alternate with, between heavy and light tasks. 
skip some activities if you need to. Pace yourself. Don't rush. Rest before you feel tired. Keep your schedule fat flexible. Fourth is positioning. Think about your body positioning during work. Sit down whenever you can. Keep your body straight so that your lungs can breathe better. Positive attitude. I know it's easier said than done, but focus on what you can do. Be creative in finding ways to adapt to your activities. Breathe. Six one is firstly breathing. This is one of the most important ones. Allow for better, it allows for better emptying the stale air from your lungs. Exhaling should take about twice as long as inhaling. Use your pursely breathing when you feel out of breath. Seventh is practicing relaxation. It can help restore your body energy. Uh, you know, you can use any techniques like yoga, meditation to help that. And these are here are some tips for activities of daily living. Um, it, it goes hand in hand with planning. And so you if you have a designated dressing area, then you make sure that you have all your clothes, everything in one place. So you avoid walking and making unnecessary trips. Dress the lower body first. That takes a little more energy than dressing the upper body. You can sit down to undress, wash, and dry whenever possible. If you can choose a loose fitting clothes so that they're not too tight and the lightweight clothes whenever possible. Make sure your bathroom is vent uh, very well ventilated. Instead of using aerosols, consider using roll-ons or cream deodorant. And try to use the electric gadgets or any assistive device you can. For cooking, you can pretty much do the same thing. Try to do whatever chores you can sitting down. Use the you make the large quantities so that you don't have to make it over and over again, but you can store it in individual size portion so that it's you, you just have to unfreeze one at a time. Consider using ready, ready meals and also using lightweight cook utensils so that it's easier on your body. If you can, use the rolling cart for transporting the item or a walk walker with the wheels. For household works, the tips are pretty self-explanatory. Make sure you can, you again, spread it out throughout the week. If you, for example, you know, you can um, also keep the garbage by the door so that you can empty it frequently instead of lifting it and putting it away again and again. If you keep the dishes soaked for a while, you know, it will eliminate some need for scrubbing and save your energy. You can ask for help if possible to for family or friends or, or caregiver to do some heavier lifting jobs. And then also use the lightweight bedding or pillows whenever possible. For shopping, again, this is more of a planning you have to, you know, if you can make a list, you can avoid frequent trips. If you are going to grocery shop, maybe you can use the electric card if you if um, you cannot walk or if you have to stand for a longer period of time. You can also make two stacks of perishable and non-perishable food so that when you are, when you get home, Maybe you can keep the perishable food at first, take a rest, and then go grab the non-perishable food items as it may not, it will not get go bad. You can do the lighter shopping yourself and maybe again ask for help if possible from family, friends, caregiver. You can try internet shopping um, so that it gets delivered and you can save a trip. Again, um, for laundry, try to use any gadgets you can, for example, the reacher for getting the clothes in and out of washer or dryer, um, using a cart with the wheels, uh, try to sit down to fold clothes or iron the clothes. If you love to do gardening, again, you know, try to keep the basket at a lower level, sit down, use the wheels um, 
stands or use the electric gadgets, or if not, maybe if you can afford, you can use, you know, try employ a gardener. It is very important to conserve energy and ask, asking for help. And I'm sure that there are people who would love to help if you ask and let them know you do need help. That's about it for me. I'll be open to any questions if you may have. Were there any questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Shopa. Um, you've really shared a lot of useful information and easy ways that people with COPD, COPD can improve their quality of life. Um, now let's go to Tan, who will be presenting our door prizes. Thank you, Sabrina. Let me share my slide. Now it's time for door prizes. We, we create a list of all our attendees, assign a number to each of you, and draw a random number corresponding to your name. You must be present to win, so we will ask each winner to click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen to let us know you, that you are here. And now, let's begin. For today, First door prizes. We have three Prince California shirts. And this, this the t shirts with a Prince California logo here. And let me call the first winner. And the first winner is. Okay, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't see the hand raised. Okay. So yes, so Alexander is the winner of the first prize. Congratulations, Alexander. Thank you, Alexander. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the winner of the second Prince California t-shirt is Michael Baro Baroga. Are you there? Okay, Michael is there. Congratulations and thank you. And the winner of the third Prince California t shirt is Bivoli de Guzman. Oh, you there, Bivoli. Thank you for raising your hand. Congratulations. Okay. Now we have another gift. Um, next, we have a Priest California volunteer mug. And the winner of this is Michael Magana. Are you there? Or Michelle, yeah. Oh, I see. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have the final door prize. For our final door prize, we have a compact collapsible umbrella. And the final winner is Mussaras Asmes. Are you there? Please raise your hand. Congratulations. You have the collapsible umbrella. Winners, please email to charminelunchrs.org with your mailing address so we can mail your prize to, to you next week. We, ho we hope you enjoy them. And now back to Sabrina. I will send uh, the email to the chat so you can, can see it. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. And now for our final special guest, we have Kalpana Devi Thiagarajan. Kalpana is a certified yoga instructor, having completed a 200-hour teacher training and is a member of the senior yoga faculty at Yoga Bharati in San Jose, California. 
She has worked at various companies as an engineer and product manager, leaving a position at eBay in 2019 to pursue her passion for yoga. She's very enthusiastic about teaching yoga classes for both adults and kids. She loves reading, is passionate about the topics of history, literature, and philosophy, and enjoys sharing the knowledge that she has gained. Kalpana will now lead us in some yoga breathing exercises that are suitable for all and adaptable as needed. Please proceed, Kalpana, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Sakrina. I appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, I can, um, I would actually like to share my slides. All right, so um, uh, hello and welcome to everyone. And for the next uh, 15 minutes or close to 15 minutes, I'll be just going and walking over. Uh, one half of the lecture, one half of this part will be divided with uh, a talk on understanding yoga and breathing and what goes into managing breathing disorders like asthma and uh, COPD. And after uh, that, I will go into some simple, very, very simple and easy routines that will help uh, all of you. All right, so let's begin at the beginning, uh, yoga and breathing. Uh, and you know, feel free, if you have any questions, you can put them on the chat or we can take questions at the end with uh, um, whatever works. Um, so starting with yoga and breathing, yoga, as most of you know, is a um, set of routines or exercises that people use for flexibility and uh, stretching. Um, there are additional dimensions of yoga that really help in making it a very holistic discipline. And one aspect of it is the breath part of it. We will be going into what the other aspects of it and how those play when a person, uh, when, you know, there are issues or stresses or impacts that happen in the uh, body. And so, uh, so let's try to, uh, you know, everyone, just, let's just do this one simple routine. Just sit over here, sit wherever you are, um, close your eyes and um, take a few breaths here. I'd like to make yourself comfortable first, seated. Find your grounding making yourself feel stable, just a sense of connection. And once you feel safe, stable, and connected, bring your attention to the breath. Observe the way the air goes into the nostril as you inhale. And as you exhale, observe the way the air rushes out. Again, a deep breath in. Observe how the chest cavity opens up, the tummy bulges. And as you exhale, observe how the tummy just goes in, the chest cavity caves in, relaxing further. Now a small game for the mind. Try to observe the breath going through the nostril and try to find which nostril are you breathing through right now. Is it the right or is it the left? And feel free to share it on the chat window. You can go ahead and open your eyes. Um, and yeah, you can just say it. There's no right or wrong answer in this. It's either left or it's right. It can be anything. And this is a small thing that you can do whenever you're off, off uh, you feel off. You just want to sit down and focus on the breath and try to see which nostril are you breathing through. Okay, uh, coming back to uh, our lecture. So the yoga and breathing aspect. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to understand anatomy. We are also going to understand how this works in, in, in and you know it goes off and it's it's not working correctly. And then we're going to feed this in to what the di different dimensions of yoga is and where this can go wrong. And with that knowledge, we will do some more routines after we're done with the slides. Okay, so starting from our breath, we just took a few breaths. We were pretty present when we were taking those breaths. So let's see what's happening once you take that inhalation. So as air goes in, it, it travels into the nose, into the 
uh, uh, airways into the trachea and finally into the airways and finally into those small bits uh, that are called the air sacs in the lung. And from there, uh, they are then taken. So that's the first part of the inhalation. So that's the first part of your respiration. You take in air, it goes through the airways all the way to the air sacs. And from the air sacs that you see over here, they get into the blood vessel, into the blood stream. And so an exchange of gases happens. Oxygen is taken into the blood and carbon dioxide is given out. So that precious oxygen that was taken in, that travels all the way to the air sac, is then taken into the bloodstream. And from there, from the blood, it reaches all the different organs and the, the different cells in the body. And from there, they get into the cells, uh, which then utilize the oxygen. Uh, and of course, there's already glucose. And together with oxygen and glucose, you have energy that is being used, prepped for the body. And so these, this is actually a very powerful engine that is powering each one of, one of us every minute, every second, every time we take in a deep breath or a good breath, this is what is happening within us. Um, okay. Right, hold on. And so let's see what happens when, um, you know, what is happening in the lungs. So you have these airways uh, through which air travels. The one on the left side is a picture of a smooth airway where, you know, there's no problem and airway, the air just flows in through without any obstruction, without any issue. The one on the right is where you see there is some sort of an inflammation that's happened to the airways and or there could be excess mucus production, which is obstructing that air that flows through. And so this sort of a constriction that happens, um, bronchoconstriction that happens, does not allow for air, the smooth passage of air, and that can lead to those the disorders, restricted breathing. Now, let me take a pause and understand what restricted breathing here is. Uh, so just to put it uh, in, a, in one way, breathing is not, um, is not, it's not binary state. It's not, I have a good breathing or I don't have a good breathing. It's not that way. All of us have a sense of restricted breathing. Most of us breathe shallow. Most of us, uh, you know, there is a restriction in the way we breathe. And so there are different levels and different degrees to it. Um, you, so it, in order for it to become a disorder, it, it takes a long more time, a chronic state of restricted breathing, and then it, it becomes a disorder. But in, in essential sense, most of us have this uh, restricted breathing. And one way to notice it is um, when you're uh, upset, unhappy, or anxious, just observe the kind of breaths that you're taking. It will be shallow. It will be light. It will not be full lunged, right? And so um, how does this play into all of this? So this, this is the aspect where we get into um, understanding yoga in its different layers. So just as we see each of us as, um, um, how, how do you put it? Like you see, you, you are made up of this, right? When you say, this is me, you say, this, this is this person. Um, and I can see myself, I can touch myself, feel myself. So this is a person, right? This, the grossest layer of a personality is the, the body. And so that is what we call the physical layer, the one that is obvious. And internally going a little deeper, there is something called an energy layer. And that constitutes the, the driving force within us that helps us uh, do many things in a day. Right. Um, the moment you wake up, oh, I need a cup of coffee. And so there's a thought that comes and that thought drives you to go and do what you want to do to grab that cup of coffee. And so that energy that kicks into motion is called the energy layer. Right. Um, that is a life driving force. So another word for it is the life driving force within us. Uh, without which, of course, you know, that's that's the difference between a live person and a person who's dead. So that kicks us into action every day. Um, and not just into action, even when you're sleeping, it's happening, it's just putting you to sleep. And so it is there 24 by seven, it's just there, that energy layer. And then going a little more subtler. So the, the energy layer is not something that you can see. So the most grossest, the, the gross layer is the physical layer. Beyond that is the energy layer. And behind that is the emotional layer. And that is where your thoughts come in, your feelings come in, your emotions. I like my coffee, I don't like tea, um, or I hate something, or I love something. And so all of these emotions, intense or light, doesn't matter. All of them emanate from this layer of emotional um, being within us. 
And behind that, we have a subtler layer, which is the intelligence layer. And that is the logical and rational layer that comes into play when you feel that, oh, I need to reach out for that cup of coffee. It's like, no, it's better you cut down on your sugar. And so that's the rational layer that's at work at that time. And it is telling you not to go ahead and you know grab a chocolate or something like that. Um, and beyond that is a very um, is a is a very um, is the subtlest layer, uh, and for lack of a better word, I just put happy layer. We call it the bliss layer or something. Uh, but it basically means to say that it's the innermost self within us, which is uh, a calmer uh, and a very connected layer. And um, touching those layers during uh, either during deep meditation or during deep sleep or intense. Um, relaxation, active relaxation, you kind of touch into that layer and that uh, helps you feel much more rejuvenated. And so all of these layers comprise a human being um, in the yogic sciences. We, it says that um, all of us have these different layers and we are being driven by these different layers and these are the ones that constitute our identity, our personality, our being. And this is there with everyone. It's, it's just there with everyone. So let's Let's start from, um, let me give you with an example, I can explain this. So let's say you're stuck in traffic. You're out there, you probably have to go and reach a certain place um, in the next 10 minutes, but there's traffic in front of you, which is definitely going to take um, you know, 20 minutes to clear out. Um, and typically our reaction is coming from the emotional layer, which is not liking the situation, obviously, and then it's getting worked up. Oh. Maybe I should have left 10 minutes earlier. Oh, I should have probably checked Google Maps. I should have checked traffic uh, conditions. Or I shouldn't have signed up for this at this time. And so the mind is in overdrive at this time. It is constantly trying to think if, when, what, and um, you know, probably even um, not happy with the people around, uh, the people who are taking time or dispersing the, um, you know, the accident that happened. And so the mind has gone into such overdrive and it is constantly thinking. So the speed of thoughts has increased at that moment. And that comes into the layer of the breath. And when you look it into, into the, uh, the breath uh, layer, you would find that your breath has gone shallow. It has picked up speed and uh, it's the count, the number of breaths has gone up. And so all of this happens. So there's an inconsistency in the breath pattern. As opposed to when right now, when as you're sitting and listening to me, your breath has a certain pattern, as opposed to when it is in that situation. And then finally, when it percolates into the system in different types, um, it goes, uh, it can go into different areas. So it can affect people differently. The, uh, it is always the weakest link of the genetic structure. And for some people, it comes and manifests as disorders in the, um, in the uh, respiratory airway. And so... This is like a cycle, right? So the stress that emanates from the situation can affect our breathing. It can affect the, uh, the, 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 the constriction of the airways. So all of this happens. And then that kind of follows into a loop over here. And so the moment we try to kind of calm ourselves, even at the emotional layer, we can have a sense of um, ability to, uh, to say, okay, let's, calm ourselves down. Let's take a deep breath. So the first thing that is uh, probably said is, okay, you know, let's just take a deep breath and all. And so to course correct at that point of time is something that yoga helps. It makes it possible. I mean, it's so easy to say right now talking about it, but in that moment, our inherent tendencies play up and we just react to situations. But as you keep practicing and yoga over a period of time on a consistent basis, it helps you to connect a little um, uh, deeper, and then it tries to stave off uh, uh, the issues that can come with this. Hi, so, uh, Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, so you have about 12 minutes, just as a heads up. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, connections that happen when a situation arises and the way we react to the situation using our different layers. Um. And so um, as we do these routines, with this thought, uh, with, these, with this information that we were talking about, try to you know, apply them in the routines. And if you were to apply them over a period of time or days, months, they really help 
in uh, calming the person down and bringing the breath rate down and causing for a, and creating a better environment for uh, healthier uh, breathing. Um, okay, so how is, has this been tested? Um, do we know if there's any proof around this? There have been two tests that was done. One was done way back in 1985. It was a controlled study where uh, yoga was tested for a group of people uh, who were in the test. So there was a combination, there was a uh, tests which were done on people who were in control and people who were in the test. And uh, for those who were in the test group, uh, people were given practices done over for probably a few days as the number is out there in the test. And so there was a, a number of days that the people had to do the test, an hour every day. Right? They were taught by uh, guided uh, yoga practitioners. And uh, there was a definite uh, improvement in the measurement that, uh, and the parameters that measure their breath. So this was 1985. And just as recent as a decade back, 2010, there was another more uh, um, broader test uh, that was done um, uh, studying the effects of yoga on asthmatic patients. And so uh, that is also, uh, you can, these articles can be, they're on public domain and they can be looked up. Um, and so it's uh, usually fantastic to see the effects of yoga on um, and on the body system, uh, playing up on the body system, not just like right away, but over a period of time. But even otherwise, you cannot deny the effect of the practice on a person as and when you do it, which really, really helps. Um, and so, um, I've I've come to the uh, part of the lecture where I'm done with the talk. Um, and so, if there are any questions, uh, you can you can unmute and ask me questions before we go on to the routine. Okay. All right. So, no questions, but feel free to um, post questions in the chat. So. I can also look them up. Uh, so starting with a few routines, um, it's nice if we can have some videos on. So it'll be good to see uh, if you guys are doing it and it's fun to do it with people around. Okay, so we'll start with first um, centering ourselves. You can close your eyes and sit with your back without, uh, with minimal support. Um, on the lap, or on the side, on the armrest, if you're seated on a chair, a neutral back, then parallel to the floor, gaze ahead. Oh, okay. I got a message that um, attendees are unable to share video. That's fine. Um, but if you do have questions, you can unmute and ask if that's possible. Continue just observing and being aware generally of the body, of the surrounding. And slowly bringing your attention to the breath. Taking nice deep breaths. And with every exhale, observe the chest, the tummy, the shoulders, everything relax. And with each subsequent breath, try to relax it further. You can also observe the breath as it goes in, the temperature of the air. Is it cool? Is it hot? Is it warm? And as you exhale, observe the breath temperature, the change in the temperature of the breath. Cool as you breathe in. Warm as you breathe out.
And if you could not find whether you were breathing through the left or the right, now is your time to Again, there is no right or wrong. Sometimes of the day it's left, sometimes of the day it's right. Each nostril takes a turn after a certain duration of time. And with that, open your eyes. And let's do some more routines that are kind of light, but um, it's not too much. But for that, I would like you to stand up. Okay. So this is how it goes. All you have to do is stand up. And so if you, if, since you've been seated for some amount of time, it's a good idea also to just check it out. Stand up, use this opportunity to just create some movement over here. You can stand with your legs a few inches apart, palms by the side of the body. And as you inhale, take your hands up and hold, make fists, uh, make, uh, um, clasp your fingers and turn the palm up towards the ceiling. As you exhale, release and lower your arm. So inhale and take it up, palms to ceiling. Stretch up, lengthen the spine. Exhale. And relax. One more time. Inhale up. Arms to ceiling. And just feel the entire body lengthen up. Chin can touch the chest to increase the length in the spine. But all this at the same time, you're trying to stretch the entire body especially feeling it at the side from the heel of the foot to the heel of the toes, uh, the hand. Holding it right there as you keep breathing nice and deep and feel your tummy. And as you exhale this time, a small change in the instructions. Observe the arm go behind the neck. Inhale, stretch up. Exhale and down. Inhale, stretch up. Exhale and down. Inhale up. Exhale down. Inhale up. And this time, you're going to turn to the side. Exhale, turn to the right. Twist. Feel the twist in the spine. Inhale to center. Exhale to the left. To the center. Right, inhale, center, exhale, left, back to center, and exhale, dropping the arm very gently with control, and shake it out. All right, that's good. I hope you guys have been doing that, and you'll feel a lot more, um, just the feel of blood rush through and um, a lot of stimulation happening just by these simple uh, routines. And you're also opening up those lungs as you reach up to the sky. And so that helps with taking uh, deeper breaths. All right. So now the next one is uh, we're going to stand on our toes. So if you can stand on the toes, but take it easy. Always try to use a wall for support if you need. Um, this is, uh, we'll be lifting the ankles of the, the heels of the ground. So palms on the heels. Thighs. Inhale, reach up again and lift the heels off the ground. Exhale, synchronizing the movement of the arm, the breath, and the heel all at the same time. Inhale up. Exhale down. Two more. Inhale up. Remember to synchronize that breath. On the inhale and on the exhale. Inhale up. And reach up. Let's hold it here. Keep breathing. Never hold the breath. 
Keep breathing while you're actively trying to lift the heels off the ground, staying put there, while lengthening the spine, opening the chest. Nice deep breath. Exhale, lowering the arm. And finally, when the palms touch the thighs, the heels touch the ground, and your exhalation is over, relax. Okay, so the next one is palms together in front. We're going to open the arms to the side. All right, inhale, open the arm to the side. Exhale, back to center. Inhale. Exhale. Come closer. Inhale. And exhale. And gently lower the arms. I think I'm out of time. But the key point in this is to connect your breath with your movement. And when you do that, uh, you're a lot more in awareness of what you're doing. And so that really helps build your conscious thought processes going into any action that you're doing and your intention. And so over a period of time, they really help you much better. And of course, the physical part of it is you're breathing much better. Okay, I think I'm done. So thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, Kalpana. We really appreciate it. Um, after practicing those techniques that you've shown us today, I hope that our audience members feel as energized as I do. Um, now, as we're near the end of today's event, I'll pass it to you, Jamie. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, before we finish up, we'd like to know about how much you learned today during our presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Um, in a moment, a little window will pop up asking you, did you learn something today in our presentation? Please choose your answer, either A, a lot, or B, a little. All right. Uh, well, hopefully we have all learned a lot today. I certainly know that I have. Thank you for your answers, and thank you so much for coming to our event today. We are grateful to today's expert speakers and our sponsors and partners and the Breathe California staff for making this event successful. We hope you'll be able to put what you've learned today to good use. Please be aware that you'll find lots of useful information and materials about COPD in many languages on the website of our partners at NHLBI. That's www.nhlbi.nih.gov slash breathe better. And if you have questions about the lung health programs that Breathe California offers in Bay Area communities, please visit www.lungsareus.org to learn more. We appreciate your time and your participation. Please have a wonderful day and take care. Mm -hmm.